morning, church family. So good to see each of you here today. The thoughts that I'm going to share with you this morning are from a sermon by Mark Finley. But before we start, I'd like to pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study your word. May it speak with power to our hearts. And may the life-giving power of your Holy Spirit be present with us, I pray in your name. Amen. Every revival in the history of Christianity has taken place because of the powerful moving of the Holy Spirit. Throughout the four great chapters on the Holy Spirit in the book of John, where Jesus introduces us to the subject of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16, in those chapters, the Holy Spirit is mentioned as he or him 24 different times, which is really quite significant. In the book, Gospel Workers, the author makes this remarkable statement. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of our needs, and we must have the holy unction from God and the baptism of his spirit, for this is the only efficient agent in the proclamation of sacred truth. It is the spirit of God that quickens the lifeless faculties of the soul to appreciate heavenly things and attracts the affections toward God and his truth. This is an amazing statement. Actually notice it says that it's the Holy Spirit that quickens or makes alive the lifeless faculties of the soul. Unless we have that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, our spiritual life becomes dull and our spiritual faculties are dead. The other thing about this statement that is very interesting is it says that if we are attracted to heavenly things, it is through the Holy Spirit. So we can go through the motions of Christianity. We can go through all those perfunctory duties, praying, studying the Bible. But unless the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, unless God's Holy Spirit changes us and transforms us and creates within us the new life with God, unless the Holy Spirit is resonant within us, the faculties of the soul will become spiritually dead. Many people fail to understand the truth that the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. Dr. Bill Bright, founder and former president of Campus Crusade for Christ, had his organization take a survey of people about their knowledge of the Holy Spirit. The results concluded that nearly 95% of the respondents had little knowledge of who the Holy Spirit is or why he exists. The respondents were Christians, and it's quite amazing that 95% of all the Christians surveyed had no idea who the Holy Spirit was and why he existed. A.W. Tozer, famous revivalist of the past century, said this, the idea that the Spirit held, excuse me, let me start that again. The idea of the Spirit held by the average church member is so vague as to be nearly non-existent. So if that is true, and surveys bear out the fact that it is, and if it is true that the Holy Spirit reawakens the lifeless faculties of the soul and draws us out to understand heavenly things, if it's the Holy Spirit that changes us and transforms us from within, and yet there's a lack of fundamental knowledge about the Holy Spirit, a lack of basic understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how he works. Bill Bright goes on to say in his book, Purpose and Power, page 34, I am personally convinced that if today's Christians better understood the Bible's basic teachings about the Holy Spirit and then invited the Holy Spirit to release his power in their lives each day, they would experience unprecedented joy and personal fulfillment. More than that, our verbal and nonverbal witness for Jesus would sweep the world. Would you like to experience deeper joy in your life? Would you like to experience greater purpose? Would you like to experience greater peace and greater, a greater sense of fulfillment, a greater sense of power? Understanding the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the answer to that question. Would you like to experience an unprecedented intimacy with God? a closeness to God like you have never experienced before, 
a sense of God's presence, a sense that you know God, a sense that your prayers are going higher than the ceiling and that you're really connecting with God. What is that vital link that links earth with heaven? It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So I repeat, would you like to experience unprecedented intimacy with God? I know that this is the desire of my heart and I hope it's the desire of your heart. Would you like to receive Christ's supernatural power to live a victorious Christian life? Did you notice that some people struggle again and again to gain the victory in their own life? They struggle over things like anger, bitterness, gossip, lust, impatience, unkindness and ingratitude. They struggle again and again. It's like they're chained. It's like they're bound to these sins. It's the Holy Spirit entering into our lives that gives us the power for victory and the power to overcome. Would you like to be a powerful witness for Jesus in the world? Why is it that at times we may give out a piece of literature, give out a book, pray with somebody, study the Bible with somebody, and it seems to have little impact in their life? Could it be because our lives are not filled with the third person of the Godhead and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Personally understanding who the Holy Spirit is and receiving him into your life is the key to a fulfilled Christian life. If we want deep purpose, if we want power in our lives, if we long for something more, possibly you've come to a plateau in your life, possibly you've come to a point where you feel stuck. Could it be that what you're really longing for is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, the power of the third person of the Godhead? The Bible teaches that there are three separate and distinct beings in the Godhead. They are not three beings merged into one. We see that outlined in scripture. You don't have to understand everything about something to appreciate it. Let me give you an example. There's electricity here in this building. We have lights that are shining to allow us to see a little more clearly. If you ask me what the mathematical formula for electricity is, I couldn't tell you. If you asked me how electricity functions so that the power produces light, if I told you that there were pictures floating around this room and if I had a little box with a glass on it and a remote, I could get those pictures to show on a screen, how do you explain a television wave or how do you explain radio waves that go through the sky? Because I don't understand everything about electricity doesn't mean that I'm never going to flip a light switch. Because I don't understand everything about how television waves work doesn't mean I'm not going to push a remote. It's the same thing with the divine things. We may not understand it fully, but here's an important point. When something is infinite, you will never understand everything about it. But that doesn't mean that you can't, un that you can't study, sorry. If something is infinite, the more you study it, the more beautiful it becomes. The more it becomes like a multifaceted diamond that you hold in your hands and you turn it. And as the sunlight reflects off that diamond, you see more of its beauty. And that's exactly what it's like when you study the Holy Spirit. The more you study, the more you understand it, the more beautiful it becomes to you, and the more power from the Spirit comes into your life, because the more you understand, the more you can appropriate the Holy Spirit's power. Let's look at Matthew 28, verse 19. Go there, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice in this passage, you don't have one greater God and two lesser gods, there's no difference. If you've got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three separate and distinct divine beings. When you look, for example, at Ephesians 2, verse 18, it's very similar. Through him, that's through Christ, we have access by one spirit under the Father. So here in one Bible passage, you have Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, three separate and distinct from the other. One of these has their own function, so they're not the same in function. They are the same in person, three distinct and separate beings with different functions. 
There's a fascinating passage in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 through 15, where he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. This is Jesus speaking. So God has a will. Jesus comes to do the Father's will. Then it says in verse 10, By that will we have been sanctified. If you look further down in the passage, you will notice that there is something else that's taking place, and that is Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So here in this passage, you have the Father who wills our salvation. You have Christ who tabernacled in human flesh, Christ who comes to live the life we should have lived and die the death we should have died, the Son who comes and works out our salvation. As you let your eyes drop down in the passage, it tells us about the fact that the Holy Spirit witnesses to all of this. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit play a part together in our salvation. That's Paul's point in Hebrews chapter 10. It is the Father who wills our salvation. The incredible good news is that the Father in heaven has willed your salvation before you were even born. He had a divinely predestined plan for you to be saved. He willed your salvation. Your choice can determine whether you will accept his plan or not, because he has a pre-designed plan. That doesn't mean you are locked into that plan. What it does mean is that he willed your salvation. But who worked out your salvation? Jesus came and dwelt in human flesh and met the devil head on. Jesus came and faced Satan's temptations. Jesus worked out the plan of the Father. But how do we have access to that plan? Who witnesses that plan? It's the Holy Spirit living in our lives who was a witness to the plan of salvation. Throughout scripture, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit cooperate to accomplish heaven's purposes. In the plan of redemption, they work together separate, distinct beings, but all working for our salvation. Let's go back and notice some of the milestones of creation. In Old Testament history, if you go back to creation, for example, the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1. But then Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 says that Christ created the heavens and the earth. It says that Christ created all things. But then in Genesis 1, it says the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. How do you explain that? Again, the Father wills creation. He is the divine strategist who plans it. Christ carries out those plans, but how? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Think about, for example, Jesus' baptism and what happens. The Father speaks from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So you have Jesus going into the water, the Father speaking from heaven, and then the Holy Spirit comes down upon Jesus. What about Christ's death and resurrection? Who raised Jesus from the dead? Did Jesus raise himself from the dead? Did the Holy Spirit raise him? Yes, yes, and yes. In other words, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all participated in Christ's resurrection. Jesus said, if I lay down my life, I will take it up again. It says that the Father's power raised him from the dead. In the New Testament, Romans says that the Holy Spirit raised him. Any contradictions? Not at all. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit participate in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Throughout the Bible, you have this concept of the Godhead, Father, and Father Son, and Holy Spirit working together to accomplish their purpose for humanity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, you have these three mentioned again, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now notice the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. So God's love provides grace and we receive that grace through the power of the Holy Spirit. All through scripture, you have this idea of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working for our salvation. Isn't that incredibly good news? Heaven has provided everything possible for you to be saved. Heaven has provided the richness of the heavenly gifts to save you and to save me. Heaven has provided grace, 
that grace flows from the heart of God who loves us beyond what we will ever know. He wills us to be saved, but that grace is received through Christ. As the Holy Spirit applies that grace to our hearts, we come to Jesus and recognize the Father's love. We recognize the Father's desire for us to be saved as we come to our knees seeking God. Because of the love that has been manifest to us by the Father through Christ, the Holy Spirit impresses us with the attitudes in our hearts and lives that separate us from God. There may be bitterness within, there may be resentment, there may be anger towards someone else, there may be self-centeredness and egotism and pride. As we're on our knees praying, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us those things in our lives that are not in it harmony with God's will. The Holy Spirit also grants to us the power to overcome. So it's the Holy Spirit, that third person of the Godhead, not some impersonal force, not some unusual power, but it's rather the power of the Godhead through the Holy Spirit that enters our life. When you look at the Holy Spirit in Scripture, the Holy Spirit has the attributes of personality. For example, in Genesis 6, when it's talking about the flood, it says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. Romans chapter 8 says that the Holy Spirit witnesses or pleads for us. The Holy Spirit presents before God's throne our prayers and groanings that cannot be uttered. He strives, pleads, and witnesses. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. It's through the Holy Spirit that we enter into intimate communion with the divine. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals to us who Jesus is, who reveals to us the love of God. It's the Holy Spirit that we enter into our prayer life with. This intimate relationship with God in John 14, verse 9, Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. So when Christ came, he was the representative of the Father. If you look at the Old Testament, the Father is on center stage. We see Jesus veiled in the sacrifices and the various feasts that the Old Testament Israelites performed. In the New Testament, Jesus is on center stage. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he comes and touches the eyes of the blind, and they're opened. He touches the ears of the deaf, and they're unstopped. He touches the withered man's arm, and it's healed. He touches the lame man's legs and they jump and walk again. He delivers demoniacs and forgives a woman caught in adultery. So Jesus is on center stage in the New Testament. Paul speaks about him. Every New Testament writer is saturated with Jesus, Jesus and the grace of God. When Christ ascends to heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit and the dispensation that we are living in right now is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. God longs to pour out his spirit in abundance upon his people. The Holy Spirit is just as real, just as much a divine person, just as much a member of the Godhead as the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit, according to scripture, is a divine person, not some force or something that simply proceeds from the Father. Leroy Froome in his book, The Coming of the Comforter, on page 41 writes, Jesus was the most marked and influential personality ever in this world, and the Holy Spirit was to supply his vacated place. Now notice this sentence is crucial. No one but a person could take the place of this wondrous person. No mere influence would ever suffice. So the Holy Spirit, if he's going to come in Christ's stead, must indeed take the place of Jesus. Therefore, he has to be a divine personality. In the book Evangelism by Ellen White, page 615, it confirms the biblical truth that the Holy Spirit is a divine person or personality. There are three living persons in the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who received Christ by living faith are baptized. And these powers will cooperate with obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Notice what it says. There are three living persons in the heavenly trio. Have you ever heard a lady's trio sing? 
They're singing the same song, but each one of the trio has a different voice inflection. Each one of the trio has a different part to sing, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three living persons in the Godhead, and each one with a different role to play. The Holy Spirit comes with fullness of power to change and transform our lives. If we understand who the Holy Spirit is, the third person of the Godhead, and get on our knees and claim and plead for the Holy Spirit, you remember what it says in the book of Luke in chapter 11. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will, you ha will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? The Holy Spirit comes as we're on our knees, praying and seeking God for his power to come in and change our lives. Let's go to Jesus' teaching on the Holy Spirit. What did Jesus teach about the Holy Spirit, and why is what Christ taught about the Holy Spirit so life-transforming? John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor hears him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So Christ Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead and would come and live within us. That is what the Bible teaches. We live in a world where seeing is believing. As Christians, we come in faith, accepting what the word of God says. Or Jesus says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and he's going to live and dwell within you. He's going to journey with you through the dark valleys of life, walking by your side. The first and second person of the Godhead, the Father and Son, take up residence in our hearts through the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he was going back to heaven, did not leave us orphans. He didn't go back to heaven and abandon us. He didn't leave us alone in this world to struggle. He did not ascend to heaven and leave us alone. In John 14, verse 18, he says, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Christ promised that he would, that he would come to his disciples. He returned to them through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For, exa for example, Jesus fills us with his personal presence through the Holy Spirit. In the book Steps to Christ, pages 74 and 75, it says this, Pentecost brought them in the presence of the Comforter, of whom Christ had said, He shall be in you, and said, It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come to you. Henceforth, through the Spirit, Christ was to abide continually in the hearts of his children. Their union with him was closer than when he was personally with them. If you knew Jesus was going to be here, wouldn't you want to sit at his feet? Wouldn't you want to listen to what he had to say? Now every believer in the world, because of the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit could be present everywhere, we can experience this closeness with Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is the paraclete, the one alongside that is here to help. Jesus used the word paraclete to describe the Holy Spirit. Think of somebody who will supply all your needs. How does Jesus know our needs? Because he tabernacled in human flesh. He was hungry. He was tired. He was without a home. He was rejected and despised. He suffered hunger. He suffered physical, mental, and emotional pain. There at the cross, all the disciples forsook him and fled. Jesus himself felt the full gamut of human pain, the full gamut of emotional trauma. And so when you and I get on our knees to pray, we know that Christ understands what we're going through because he walked the way before us, because his footsteps have trod our path. He sends the Holy Spirit to come along our side as our helper to strengthen us, to encourage us, to lift the burden of discouragement, to bring comfort and peace and joy to our hearts. So if you're feeling lonely, if the road is rough, if the thorns on the road of life have been bruising your feet, the good news is Jesus understands. And as you get on your knees to pray, 
he will send the comforter, the divine helper, to come by your side and to give you hope, to give you encouragement, to give you strength to go on when you experience the trauma of life. Jesus comes into our lives through the Holy Spirit to give us strength and new courage. And he says, my brother, my sister, you can make it. I'm with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, I will pray and give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Look at the word comforter. It comes from two Latin words, calm meaning with and fortus meaning strength. So the Holy Spirit is the paraclete who comes along our side. He is the comforter who strengthens us in the challenges and trials of life. The Holy Spirit is the one that is ever near when we need him. He is the one who, that provides help for our daily needs. Christ Object Lessons, page 96. A book on the parables of Jesus says this, none are so vile, none have fallen so low as to be beyond the working of the Holy Spirit. In all who would submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, a new principle of life is to be implanted. The lost image of God is to be restored in humanity. Not only is the Holy Spirit our guide, not only is he our comforter, but he is the one that takes our lives and makes us over again. That deserves repeating. None have fallen so low but that the Holy Spirit can take them and change them and lift them up. Amen. He takes us from the depths of despair to the delights of discipleship, of walking with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, an entire change can be made in your life. The Holy Spirit is also our personal teacher. Jesus said in John 14, verse 17, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will teach you all things. He talks about the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth means a number of things. First, the devil tells you lies about yourself. The devil says, you're not good enough. He says, you can never make it to heaven. The devil says, why don't you give up now? The devil says, you're worthless. And the Holy Spirit reveals the truth that you were created in the image of God. The Holy Spirit reveals the truth that Christ died for you, and because of the sacrifice of Christ, you can live in heaven forever. The Holy Spirit reveals to you that he will be by your side, helping you make it through the trials and challenges of life. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. In addition to that, the Holy Spirit reveals to us the truth. And in Steps to Christ, page 114, it says, we can attain to an understanding of God's word only through the illumination of that spirit by which the word was given. If we try to study the Bible without seeking the Holy Spirit, we're going to become confused. But God says the same Holy Spirit who revealed truth to the Bible prophets as they wrote the Bible reveals truth to us as we study the scripture. Would you like to say today, Jesus, I need your spirit in my life, and I long to have an intimate relationship with Christ. I long to have that power of Christ living in my heart. I long to have the peace, fulfillment, and meaning that only Christ can bring. If that is your desire, would you stand with me, please? Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, what wonderful news that your Holy Spirit will guide us and be our divine helper who walks by our side, guiding and directing us through life to give us hope and encouragement and tells us the truth about who you are and who we are, your beloved children, who through your awesome sacrifice made provision for us by predestining us for salvation. What a gracious Father. We love you, Lord, and want to do your will and ask for your spirit to go with us as we continue on our Christian walk. We pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen.